everybody, it's your girl Kelly Foma, aka the Pretty Afro Nerd. Good morning, and don't be rude, say it back. <laughs> but anyway, so early at work today, I was on my 15 minute break. You know, I had my coffee in one hand and I had my soy milk in the other. You know, we gotta drink soy milk because we're lactose intolerant over here. <laughs> no, but on another note, my homie's been telling me to go on Webtoons because they have all sorts of mangas and comics on it. So I did, and I happened to come across Sana. First thing first, is Anna Afro manga or not? Nah? Definitely it is. Why is it Afro? Well, because the setting's in South Africa and they also have different references of different African magic and African spirits throughout it. Why is it manga? Well, because between the settings, the expressions, and the character details, it makes it manga. Afro, manga, you get my drift? <laughs> On top of it being an Afro manga, it's also a fantasy. So peep this. The setting is set in a futuristic white apartheid town um, where the Africans, they use their magical powers to help benefit the rich white elites. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Black people with their natural abilities helping out benefit the white people. Zana, baby girl, get out. You're in a sunken place, baby girl. No, <laughs> but no, no, I really, 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 really appreciate the different melon levels are in Zana. That is until she reaches a city with all the white folks, but don't be alarmed. You know, she got her homegirl with her. Hashtag black girl magic with Visa. She's ultra dope, super tech, and she knows how to get down. Okay guys, so while I was reading Zana, I was a little thrown off when they started talking about sacrificing people or cleansing as they called it. I'm over here thinking, yo, is this the African purge? The African get out? Like, what's going on? Are y'all harvesting the organs? Like, what's what's really going on here? I had to do a little bit of my own research because I'm like, yo, all these different melon levels, African culture, I had to find out who's the homegirl who wrote the story, right? The homegirl turns out to be a white woman named Jean Baker. Hmm, yeah, I'm over here thinking, so uh, how do you relate to melanin levels? Like, how do you really relate to Zana? Like, how do you, how does that work? It happens to find out that she Googled a lot of the references to relate or find out about the different struggles that they went to. Bruh, you can't Google the struggle. You can't Google how to be black. Like, it just doesn't really mm, go coexist. Like, what? Zana gets two thumbs up in my book. <laughs> I love the shock value, the suspense, and the use of the Sangoma powers. You want to make sure you have your cup of coffee with soy milk. I would say you want to be at work on your 15 minute break. I know for me, my 15 minutes ended up being two hours. That's because Zana is a total binge worthy read. Overall, Zana is a super easy read. It's going to keep you intrigued. And they talk about African culture throughout the whole story. Go out and read it. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's your girl, Cali Foma, a.k.a. the Pretty Afro Nerd. Good afternoon. And don't be rude. Say it back. <laughs> so, you guys, I just got off of work. I finished cooking. I threw it in the oven so it could finish. And I'm chilling right now. And I happened to watch a few episodes of Afro Samurai. Um, I watched it on Revolt. You can catch it on Hulu, too, just in case you're wondering. Um, so let's get into it. Is Afro Samurai an Afro anime or nah? Most definitely nah. I mean, despite the lead character being black, he does have an Afro, but he's missing an Afro pick. <laughs> but for it to be considered an Afro anime, there has to be some sort of African cultural references in the storyline, and it's not there. So it's just a basic anime, if you ask me. The setting of Afro Samurai, it takes place in a, hmm, I'd say a shop, 70s, 80s vibe mixed with the Meiji Japan. Um, imagine being on church on a Sunday, you know, you're listening to your Baptist preacher, he's giving that gospel, he's giving that good word, and you happen to look around and you're in a Buddhist temple. Yeah, insert confused face. I get your drips. <laughs> and I'm also super disappointed with the melanin levels that are in Afro Samurai, or should I say the lack there of melanin levels. Yes, there's Afro, there's Ninja, but the rest of the ca characters are Japanese. I mean, they could have threw in some African culture, like maybe some African tribe, some language. I mean, they could have gave my brother an African sword or something. It's lacking on the African vibes. 
However, you guys, I really, really, really love the color scheme that's in Afro Samurai. I mean, it's generally with the monochromes, the blacks, and the whites, but man, the colors, they just pop at you between the reds and the blues and the gold. There's this one part where Afro, he comes in the bar, walking up cool, he's like, lemonade, ice cold. And the, the colors, I mean, the lemonade is just thinking about it. It's making me all thirsty. Waiter, where's my drink? And, you know, the artist is also the author. Um, his name is Takashi Okuzaki. He's Japanese. He was influenced by uh, soul and hip-hop music when writing this. And to me, that has absolutely no correlation to the storyline at all. It actually makes it a lot less authentic. It seems like your typical, hey, non-black author cashing in on the black characters in a non-black setting. I mean, he didn't even research the OG African samurai, Yasuke. It's a no for me, dog. I mean, yes, Samuel Jackson and RZA, y'all did your thing, but overall it's just way too much coonery for my liking and it's overly stereotypical. It's just, it didn't give me enough oomph. <laughs> However, if you did want to watch this, I would say it's something that you want to catch maybe after work while you're chilling or maybe after a paper or midterm because it does have its gore. It does have its action. It has a dope hip hop soundtrack by Wu-Tang and it has your annoying weed smoking ninja to keep you entertained. <laughs> I would say Afro Samurai. Uh, it's real easy to watch. Basic avenge, revenge, kill people along the way type of plot. So if you did want to watch it, it's totally up to you. I smell something burning. I think my food's done. So I'm gonna go check on it and I'm gonna holla at y'all on the flip side. <laughs>
Welcome to the Real Nigga Hours. And no, you can't say it back. <laughs> it's your girl, Callie Foma, a.k.a. The Pretty Afro Nerd. And y'all, excuse me, I've been practicing my moves on Street Fighter V, <laughs> as y'all can tell. And speaking of which, I've been watching a few matches on Street Fighter V, and I don't know if you guys have heard about this gamer Punk, but y'all, he is the real deal. I've been watching a lot of his matches on ESL League on TBS, and you guys can follow him on his Twitter, at punk to god Is he an Afro gamer or nah? He's definitely an Afro gamer. Victor Punk Woodley reps the ATL, aka the Derby South. <laughs> so you guys check it. He's currently sponsored by Panda Global. And he's been playing fighting games for Street Fighter 4. But he really made a name for himself at NEC 17 when he beat the fighting legend himself, Justin Wong, and 2016's Capcom Cup champion, Knuckle Dude, to take home the Street Fighter V title. So his main character, Melon Levels, they're rather low. I mean, he said he's mastered all the characters, but his main character of choice is Karen, a blonde Japanese girl. Yeah, I'm gonna let that one linger for a little bit. Yo, it is so dope to see a person of color being the number one gamer in Street Fighter V. I mean, he's only 18 and he's already racked in over 150,000 in tournaments and he just placed second in EVO. Yo, they're legit having study sessions just to beat him. Clearly, he's killing the game. I really think Punk has a ways to go in the pop-off area. I mean, he's all swaggy and saucy in his interviews, but when it comes to his matches, we don't get any of that. He just wears a lot of Pokemon hats. It could be because it's a distraction or a gimmick. Either way, as long as he keeps winning, it's all good in my book. Overall, Punk has a really simple technique and a strategy that adapts to an opponent's weakness. He rarely drops combos and seems to have a pretty good mindset. Y'all make sure to go check out Punk on Street Fighter V.